If you are able, out of honor for God's holy word, would you please stand as I read this text? Mark 7, <clears throat> verses 31 through 37, read as follows. Then he returned. Oh, sorry. I'll just read. <laughs> you know. and then he returned from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. And they brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment, and they begged him to lay his hand on him. And taking him aside from the crowd privately, he put his fingers into his ears, and after spitting, touched his tongue. And looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. And his ears were opened, and his tongue was released. And he spoke plainly, and Jesus charged them to tell no one. But the more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all things well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. May God always bless the reading and the hearing of his holy word. You may have a seat. Uh, here we are in the second of three back-to-back-to-back -back -back miracles of Jesus. All three of them uh, unified by the fact that they are all carried out beyond the borders of Israel. All three of them. Jesus has been uh, primarily, thus far, primarily ministering in Israel to Israelites, but then, as we saw last week, he very intentionally went north of Israel to Tyre and Sidon. Remember, that's Jezebel's old stomping grounds. And he had this fascinating interchange with the Syrophoenician woman. And in that exchange, something profound was made clear. Jesus did come to minister to the people of Israel first, but not to the people of Israel only. Jesus went to Gentile people and he brought his goodness and his grace and his restorative agenda to those outside the commonwealth of Israel. Why? Why? And this is largely review. What Was it because he was bored? He just caught the travel bug, perhaps, and needed to get out of town for a bit? Was it because Israel wasn't all that he had really hoped, and he got kind of fed up, and he changed his agenda mid-ministry? Did he ditch plan A and go with a plan B? We have to remember, church, what God is doing here. God is demonstrating that he is keeping his promise as he does. He keeps his promises. He made a promise so many years ago, and this is him demonstrating that he intends to keep it. God told Abraham amazing things in Genesis chapter 12. And one thing that he told Abraham is that through him, all families of the earth would be blessed. There is a global blessing coming through Abraham and through his line specifically. And we hear repeats of this throughout the scriptures in places like Jeremiah 4, Isaiah chapter 2, Isaiah 9 and 11, Psalm 2, Psalm 22, 72, and 110. We could go on. This, this is a major Old Testament theme. And we even see glimpses of, uh, in, throughout the Old Testament of this when people outside of Israel encounter the true God. I think of people like Naaman, Nebuchadnezzar, Jethro, Melchizedek. Blessing is coming to the world, and the blessing has come through the person and work of Jesus Christ. Paul tells us in Galatians 3 that Jesus is the seed of Abraham that is pictured in the promise, and that anyone who trusts in Jesus benefits from that promise. Let me just Read to you from Galatians 3 quickly, as a, by way of introduction here. Verses 7 and 8 make this clear. Know then that it is those of faith who are sons of Abraham. And in or and the scripture, excuse me, and the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So, church, that, that's largely review, but here's why I share it. We don't approach this text simply as just um, a neat miracle, uh, just another kind of 
wow occurrence. It, it is astounding, but consider the gravity of the larger context, the gravity of the Messiah leaving Israel, touching and healing unclean people, and meeting the needs of a people who for centuries have been regarded as out of bounds for God's people and God's favor. Th this is momentous that he would do these three miracles. So last week we asked the question of, of how someone ought to come to Jesus, right? considering the Syrophoenician woman, and, and she did it very well. I would commend the Syrophoenician's approach to you uh, and her hum humility, her teachability, her persistence, all of that. Um, how should someone come to Jesus? Today we are essentially asking the same question, but in reverse, and it, it's this. How does Jesus save sinners? How does Jesus save sinners? We're, we're talking about the same event, encountering Christ and submitting to him and receiving his grace. But from the reverse perspective, last week the woman came to Jesus. Here, uh, Jesus comes to this man. And so we would be fine to ask the question, which is it? Which is it? Do, do we come to Jesus or does Jesus come to us? And here's a helpful text, one of many that I, I think helps address that question. Do we come to Jesus or does Jesus come to us? This is from John 6, verse 44, and it reads like this. This is Jesus speaking. He says, no one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. So, so people do come to Jesus. Absolutely. Well, which people? Well, the people whom the Father draws to Jesus. Is there some mystery involved there? Yes, first to say, absolutely. Do we understand it fully? No, we do not have the mind of God and we aren't burdened to understand it fully, but do we trust what God has said? We, we must. What else will we listen to? Where else will we go? He has the words of eternal life, so we must trust what God has said. So today, we will see how Jesus ministers to sinners. More than that, though, we're going to see how uh, the gospel can influence and change a place. We'll see how Jesus works for his glory as he goes to the nations, which was always God's plan. May we be reminded today, also Christians, of our own status as his children. How does Jesus save sinners? There are four actions taken by Jesus in the text that will be helpful to us today. And the first is this. Jesus comes to people intentionally. Jesus comes to people intentionally. This is the first action. If I could reread verse 31. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. Now Jesus leaves Tyre and Sidon and we think, good, oh, get out of that pagan place. Uh, uh, nice thing you did for that lady and for her daughter. That was great, but it's time to go. Let's get back to what's familiar. Let's get back to our, uh, to our homeland. Ah, yes, see, he goes to the Sea of Galilee. Good, perfect, sigh of relief. Well, not quite. Uh, he does go back to the Sea of Galilee, but not the western side. He goes to the other side, the eastern and southeastern side mostly, in the region of the Decapolis. As the word suggests, uh, these are 10 uh, unified city-states that are under Roman rule and Roman privilege. Uh, uh, um, Deca, 10, Polis, city, Decapolis. The, the point, though, is that they are not Israel. Jesus did not return back to Israel. Jesus, haven't you had enough of the Gentiles? Apparently not. Now, now, why here? He could have gone back to Israel. Why does he come here of all places? Th doesn't this place uh, to the, if you've been here and we're going through Mark together, doesn't this place ring a bell for us? It should. This is where Jesus and the disciples made landfall in Mark chapter 5. This is where the scene with the demoniac took place. Remember the tombs and the pigs? That, that was here. This is in that region, so we'll come back to that later, but just put that in the back of your mind for now, that Jesus has history here. That's very important. And now he's back. He came here, and he did so on purpose. Jesus came for this man. Uh, we, we can try to say 
that Jesus was just on the road, maybe taking the scenic route home, and oh, he happened upon this man, and it was due to chance, and fortunately it got recorded. We know that's not true. We know it's not, because we're dealing with the God of history. Nothing happens according to chance. Even the roll of the dice is in the hand of God, Proverbs 16.33 says. Uh, specifically, the lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. That, that, does, that is not a biblical basis to go f gamble. <laughs> but uh, anyway. But it's, it's all under the sovereign hand of God. All things fall in line with God's eternal decree and his purposes. That's what Ephesians 1 says, among many other places. So, so this scene, like all others, this scene is God's plan carried out, executed in history, and recorded in the Gospels for the world to read and to know and to believe. There's, there's no chance at play here. There simply isn't. Jesus came uh, to this place at this time for this man. And it is the same when he comes to people to today. This has not changed. Jesus still goes to people today. I don't know if you knew that or not. Did you know that? He, he dwells in the people of his church by his Holy Spirit, the New Testament says. He ministers to people uh, by, by way of his called and collected church. He works through the preached word of God. He works through evangelism, and it is always the right place at the right time. Always. Think of it this way, church. Jesus is only ever intentional. If I could summarize that. He, he doesn't accidentally wind up anywhere. He doesn't take wrong turns or the wrong exit or anything like that. If you're a Christian, that means that at some point he came to you. And if he's come to you, you can rest assured that it was <laughs> intentional. How sweet the sound. That saved a wretch like me. We just sang that. Why me? I don't know. But praise God. He comes to sinners. That's what he does. One of the more comedic and lighthearted lines in the first Lord of the Rings movie, before things get too serious, is when Gandalf the wizard shows up for Bilbo Baggins' birthday party. And Frodo meets him on the road, if you've seen the films, and accuses him, his first words to him, <clears throat> you're late. Gandalf takes that very seriously and replies, a wizard is never late, Frodo Baggins, nor is he ever early. He arrives precisely when he means to. And they both try to keep a straight face and can't, and they laugh because it's an obvious lie. Uh, Gandalf is not being serious. But it's not a lie with our God. It's not a lie with him. Jesus is always intentional. And very good news for the world, Jesus isn't finished going places. He's not finished. He didn't make you, Christian. You were not his last stop in the plan of salvation to the world. He still intends to enter into the lives of people in Bayview, in Athol, and beyond. May we live accordingly. The second action taken by Jesus here, Jesus ministers personally. He ministers personally. This is his second action. Verse 32 says this, They brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment, and they begged him to lay his hand on him. A, a group of people hears that Jesus is around. Excellent. And they, they bring someone to him. Th this tells us they know who Jesus is to some degree, and they know that he can help. And so they get this man to him. Now, here's a, here's a question. Why isn't it enough to just say that Jesus restored a man? Just a, a very general summary. Jesus healed a person. I mean, isn't that amazing enough? That, that's all you really need to know. Mark could have saved a lot of ink here. In fact, this is kind of how uh, Matthew's gospel relays the story. Matthew just takes the entire scene and kind of summarizes it. Oh, Jesus healed a bunch of people at this time, um, many people with many different afflictions, and, and there's really no specificity about individuals given. That's what Matthew does. We could say, okay, the end. That's a general version of the story, but... That's fine. That's good. God inspired Matthew's gospel as well, so there is a purpose for that. But Mark, strikingly, being the shortest of gospels, Mark is the only writer who pauses here and who tells this speci uh, specific story about this man. Mark's the only one. Jesus healed many people, yes, but let's talk about this one. So, so that tells us something. This man wasn't just a number. 
he wasn't just a statistic. He was a man who was deaf. We, we need to know that. He could not hear. He could not experience a child's voice or a bird's song. He also couldn't speak well. He could not have simple and rich conversations with friends and family. Mark wants us to know that. Mark wants us to know the specifics of this man's affliction. More than that, though, we are not told simply that Jesus healed him. No, no, we get the most nuanced, uh, unique healing story right here. And the means of his healing is what is so intriguing. I want you to think of this, what we just read. Jesus took him aside. There was a large crowd, and Jesus separated him from the crowd. You all stay here. And he took him away, whether, you know, around the corner, behind a tree, or whatever. They found privacy. This is personal. He, he didn't want a bunch of people to see. This is me and you here. Jesus ministers this way. And what did he do? You know, he, he, this is not like, oh, wow, there's so many people here. They all need healing. Here, here's a mass blessing, and hopefully you're within the splash zone to, like, get some of the grace. No. Pulled him aside, ministered to him personally. And what did he do? He put his own fingers into the man's ears. We'll talk about that in a moment. And then he put some of his own spit on his finger and touched the man's tongue. And then he looked up to heaven and he sighed and said the word ephatha, be opened. And this man was healed. We don't get details like that with many other healing stories. So, so why all the Ritual, for lack of a better term. You know, a minute ago, think back to the Syrophoenician woman. A minute ago, on the complete opposite end of the spectrum, he cast a demon, think about this, he cast a demon out of a woman's daughter from across town without even saying a word. He, he, he told the woman after the fact, remember after the fact, he says, the demon has left your daughter. Jesus is more than capable of restoring someone by, by just willing it done. He's more than capable. So what is he doing here? Well, we know that Jesus was not conjuring anything up. He, he was not summoning some other power or casting a spell or anything like that. Remember, this, Jesus is the agent of creation. God created the universe with words. Colossians 1 tells us that was specifically through Jesus Christ. So why is he doing this? Well, the answer is quite personal, and it's very simple. This man is deaf. He cannot hear. How do deaf people communicate? With signs. They need to see what you are saying to them. This is simply a case study in Jesus meeting the person exactly where they are and making things as easy on them as possible. That's what's happening here. He is signing to the man exactly what is about to happen to him in real time. This is kind of like when Jesus raises the girl, what's his first concern? Give her some lunch. Give her something to eat. She's likely hungry. Like I said, death takes it out of you. He's just meeting someone at their most basic human need. And so he's accommodating this man. This is why we say that Jesus ministers to the individual. I will heal your ears, touching his ears, placing his fingers in his ears. I will heal your mouth, touching his tongue. And then he looks up to heaven, directing the man's own gaze, showing the man where healing comes from directing him toward God the Father, and then my favorite detail, he sighed. Uh, uh, what, what a point of mention that he sighed. It was a deep sigh, is what the language suggests, a longing sigh, a visible sigh. Th this kind of takes our mind to, to Jesus weeping at Lazarus' tomb. You see, Jesus has nothing to do with brokenness and sin and the effects of sin. They are not from him. And so in the face of deafness and incomplete speech, he sighs. And the man saw him sigh. Because sighs, as you know, are seen as well as they are 
heard. You can see a sigh. This was all done for the benefit of the man. Now, I'm I'm slow to talk about the individual uh, often, you know this, um, to, to speak on strictly individual terms because Christianity is meant to be far more corporate th- than we have made it. Um, we tend to think only in individualistic terms. You know, it's just me and Jesus out here on the prairie, whatever. I, I, don't, I don't need his body. I don't need the local church. I can be a Christian lone wolf without help and without accountability. That thought is completely antithetical to how we are meant to live. Uh, Scripture says that Christ is the head of the body, the church. You cannot have the head without the body. You, you cannot. You cannot have the building without the cornerstone. You cannot. This is why belonging to Christ's local body is so important. So I, I, I am slow to speak in such individualistic terms often, but... With that said, when it comes to the salvation of sinners and the receiving of God's grace in Christ, Jesus ministers personally. You are not saved by anybody else's experience, anybody else's confession, anybody else's repentance. It must be your own. So think with me, Christian. Whatever was going on in your life, think of of your own story. Whatever was going on in your life when you encountered Christ, you were ministered to personally. It, it, was, it, it was the right place at the right time, under the right circumstances, so that your heart was touched by God. That, that If you're a Christian, that is true of you. This is why ministry often looks different in different places. Meeting the needs of people in downtown Spokane will likely look very different from meeting the needs of someone on Parks Road. They need the same solution to the same plight. Ultimately, yes and amen, they're all rebels in need of salvation that only Jesus brings through his perfect life, his death in the place of sinners, his glorious resurrection and ascension and current reign, yes. But Jesus always ministers personally. So so for us, this is a call to know your people. If nothing else, this is a call to, to know them. Know your place. Minister, minister to the people Uh, right as they are, right where they are. Um, And as you do, the gospel is big enough for this. All kinds of different people, they will see their sin as condemning. They will see Jesus as glorious, and they will find their life in trusting and following after him. But, but, But always personally. Jesus ministers personally. That's the second action of his. The third is this. Jesus restores entirely. He restores entirely. Verse 35 says, um, his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. A a short point here, but an important one. Jesus finished the the signing and the commanding, and what happened? The man's ears were opened. His tongue was released. Just like the storm on the sea when Jesus rebuked it, the, the, the storm didn't take time to think about it. The waves didn't discuss among themselves and then come back with a rebuttal, they obeyed. So this man's physical capacities were restored in an instant by the one who created them. And why shouldn't they be? Remember when Moses was slow to get on board with God's plan and so he, he didn't want to go back to Egypt and he started digging in his shepherd pockets for lame excuses and he found several, but one of them was, I don't speak very well. As if God didn't know that, which is essentially what God says. He says in Exodus 4.11, then the Lord said to him, who has made man's mouth? Who, who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? <clears throat> Hello. Now, I, I don't know what all happened physiologically in this moment that the man was healed. Exactly. I don't know what had to happen in the ears. Was, was something replaced? Was tissue regenerated or, or, you know, recreated entirely? I don't know. And his mouth, the text says that his tongue was released. I don't know what exactly that means. But whatever Jesus did, it worked. He, he spoke plainly. He could hear. And interestingly, might be, a, might be just a minor thing, but interestingly, have you ever talked to someone who was formerly uh, deaf, but, but through awesome, 
uh, medical advances, they receive some sort of powerful implant or hearing aid, and they can suddenly hear, and they're, and they're learning to speak. They're, they're not terribly clear that on day one of hearing in their speaking. They, they still uh, speak with an impediment. But not this man. We're, we're not just told that he spoke, but that he spoke plainly with no practice. I just, I want you to, I don't believe this is an, a too far of, of an inference. The lines between the brain and the mouth were reset, it seems, so that he said his S's and his T's without having to deal with the habits he formed while deaf. He, he spoke plainly. Th this was a, a, an entire restoration, an immediate change. Now, when we, when we consider the, the senses, the, the seeing, the hearing, all of that, it, it's good to remember that the Bible uses that language, uses the idea of senses to speak about salvation a lot. Think, think about this. We've read about having eyes to see, uh, having ears to hear. We read that at the name of Jesus, every tongue will confess that Christ is Lord. We are commanded to taste and see that the Lord is good. I think of Paul speaking in Acts 17. He says, speaking of God, God made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and boundaries of their dwelling place, verse 27, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. We, we know that Jesus did not come to only heal physical ailments. Um, with him is life, life abundant, and life eternal. He, he came to bring salvation from sins. We read in Luke chapter 4, the sp this is Jesus quoting Isaiah, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has appointed me to do what? To proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. I once was lost, but now am found. Christian, when Jesus saves you, he does so with all of you in mind, not just part of you. He, he does so entirely. Now, I don't, I don't mean by that that you become perfect in a moment. Not at all. <laughs> um, if you need evidence of that, look at your own life and around the room. Um, not at all. Not, but you will be perfected in glory. And we are set on that trajectory now. What does it mean? In other words, it'd be the answer to this question. What does it mean to be a new creation? That, that we just kind of mentally assent to some higher, oh yeah, that makes sense about God, but that everything looks and stays the same? What does it mean to be a new creation? It means that God intends for us to be changed in every regard. A every area of your life, of my life, is meant to come under the lordship of Jesus. Every area. You can't think, speak, or act as you once did. How you spend your time, how you work, how you care for others, it all is to come into submission to Jesus. Jesus is not interested in being Lord over part of your life. He, he wants it all. He deserves it all. He will have it all. He is the God who restores entirely. That's good instruction and reminder for us in our Christian walk. And the, the fourth action I see, <coughs> excuse me, from Jesus. Jesus works incrementally. He works incrementally. Verses 36 and 37 read like this. And Jesus charged them to tell no one. But the more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all things well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. The immediate crowd w was naturally astonished at this healing. Uh, Jesus took the man away privately. When they went around the boulder or wherever they went, when they, w when they left, he was deaf and he couldn't talk. When they came back, he can hear and he can speak. I imagine it. It is. It's an amazing Miracle, and he charged them to tell no one. But what happens, well, what usually happens, as we've seen in Mark, the more he charged them not to tell anyone, the more they went and did just that. Jesus 
that this tells us that Jesus was likely there over a period of at least days for this to happen, to, to see the increase of his own fame spreading. This is like trying to put out a fire with gasoline. It, it, it only causes it to increase. The more he charged them not to, the more they did. We, we need to see the incremental nature of what's happening here because there are implications for us. And what do I mean by that? First, there's the immediate event in view. Jesus healed the man. They were astonished. Don't go tell people. They go and tell people. And he kept saying to them, don't tell people. And they increasingly did so. Uh, th there's an immediate and gradual increase of the knowledge of Jesus going forth in the Decapolis. More, more people are telling. More people are hearing. All of them, we read, are marveling. There's a commentator named Mark Horn who said this about this passage. He said, after Jesus has enabled a man to hear and speak, we find the people of the region hearing what happened and saying that Jesus does all things well. Jesus is restoring the world to be able to hear the gospel and speak to God's glory. It, it, it spread, you see. So there's an immediate but gradual increase, but, but also back up just a, a bit further. As I mentioned, Jesus has been here before. Mark 5. How, how was he received then, if you remember? He steps off the boat. The only one to greet him is a man full of demons. People are terrified of this man. They cannot contain this man. They reroute traffic around this man. He lives among the graves, and he cuts himself, and he cries out through the night. This is a terrifying, dangerous man. But Jesus restores him. And, and you remember, the demons go into the pigs, which go into the water. It's another amazing story. But how did it end? Uh, uh, go back to Mark 5. This is verse 17. And they, this is the people of the region, and they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. That's how it ended. The people of the region wanted Jesus gone. In fact, they begged him to leave. Not a great note to end on in terms of popularity. It's kind of like there's a reason that certain presidential candidates, depending upon their party affiliation, just don't visit certain towns. They're not terribly popular there. But there was a witness left there, if you recall. I'll continue reading back from Mark 5. As Jesus was getting in the boat, the man who had been possessed with demons begged him. He also begged him. The people begged him that he leave. This man begged him that he might go with him. And he did not permit him, but said to him, Go home and tell your friends how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis, how much Jesus had done for him, and everyone marveled. He didn't post it on Facebook once and call it done. He began to proclaim it, meaning, implying, he kept proclaiming it. The man who had housed the demons wanted to go with Jesus, and Jesus said, no, stay here and tell people. Tell people what God has done for you. So, so what do you think the man from the, who had been full of demons, the man from Mark 5, what do you think he's been doing? since Jesus' first visit and before his second visit? I think the answer is obvious. He's been telling his story. He's been sharing it. And people have been amazed. And we see the fruit of that at the beginning of our story. Jesus shows up this time, and instead of being turned away, think about this, he wasn't turned away. <laughs> You'd think they'd have posters of him up everywhere. Uh, do not let this guy in. You know, hey, we remember you. You, you killed our pigs. Get, get out of here. No, no. They received him gladly. They've heard about him and they can't get to him fast enough. That's the power of a gradual witness of Jesus spread throughout an area. Church, God is often pleased to work in a place gradually, a little bit at a time, in his timing. This, this is very on a very personal level. This is how our fights with sin go, right? Uh, you know, we, we're, we have lingering sin, we work against it, we pray, we read, we repent, uh, we, and we keep going a bit at a time. And by the grace of God, we are sanctified a bit at a time. But this is also how God tends to work in the world and in a place. Here's just a quick snapshot 
of the growth of the Christian church. And, and I understand this probably begs a ton of questions and who all is truly a Christian and all that. Just this is fine. Just listen. In the year 100 AD, 70-ish years after Christ's death and resurrection, an estimated 0.01% of the Roman Empire were Christians. That's nothing. That's minuscule. 0.01. By uh, 150 AD, that number was up to 0.07%. Still not terribly significant. By 250 AD, it was up to 2% of the Roman Empire were Christians. By 350 AD, more than half of the Roman Empire. Now there are more than 2 billion confessing Christians on the planet. So, so be reminded of the kingdom parables. Harken back to those. The kingdom is like what? It's like a mustard seed that starts small, but only increases and increases gradually. Or, if you like, it's like leaven that eventually spreads throughout an entire loaf. Whatever small slice of history we have in our lifetimes, we, we are just part of God working gradually throughout history for his purposes. But he is working. And gradually so. I can't stand here um, and tell you who will be saved and when and, and where revivals will occur. Sometimes big, amazing things happen. Tons of people are, are, uh, come to Christ at once. That's awesome. We pray for that. I, I pray that will happen here in our little part of the world. But God tends to work through normal, regular, gradual means in a place. Years and years of faithfulness. I can tell you, here's a few things we can hang our hat on. I can tell you that the knowledge of the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. I can tell you that. I can tell you that all people everywhere are commanded to repent. I can tell you that. I can tell you that Jesus has not yet returned and that our marching orders as his church are clear. I can tell you that. So may we never conclude that God is finished working either in us as people or in our place. That's, that's not ours to determine. We have good work to do. We work knowing that God is often pleased to bring things about gradually, a person at a time, a family at a time, a community at a time. This means, just very practically, this means that we joyfully start things that we may never see finished. We start things that we may never see finished because God continues to work gradually. We, we invest in people from whom we may never see a return in our lifetime. I think, it was, I think it was Mark Dever who said, some seeds that you plant will stay underground until you are underground. And then they might sprout. But we, we work. We work now with the long game in mind. That's what God has called us to. God is often pleased to do things gradually. Uh, what our investments might uh, return fruit in a generation or two. We don't know. May Bayview and Athol and Carrywood be like the Decapolis. I pray that we would be like the Decapolis in this regard. That the word of Christ starting small would spread as God's people take the story to the people. And, and, and may they marvel May they truly marvel because he has done all things well. May they long for him and may they too be welcomed into his family. And may it all be for the glory of our mighty God who saves sinners. Let's pray together. God in heaven, we do thank you that you are a God who has the world in mind. You are a God who has brought blessing to the nations through Christ. Lord, I, I thank you that that has come to us uh, through generations, through all kinds of means. Uh, we have tasted your goodness, and we share in the faith of Abraham. I, I thank you. Uh, God, we, we love you, and we praise you for that. And God, I, I pray that we would, not, we would not squander that inheritance, but that we would be faithful, just like, the, and just like the people in the Decapolis. We would tell, and we would see your fame spread. And... Uh, Jesus, that you would be famous, you would be worshipped in this place as in all others. And, and Lord, even w whatever the fruit might or might not look like in our lifetimes, I pray that we would, we would work with your gradual purposes in mind to save whom you will save according to your timing and your plan. Uh, so give us joy, give us steadfastness, and, and put us to hard work, we pray, 
for your purposes in this place. I ask this for your glory and for the good of people. I pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Um.